Thanks everyone for joining us. We hope that you find this to be beneficial. One of the interesting things we do when we're doing tax law updates, is we do one in November so that you're prepared for the preseason as, as you have your clients begin to show up in your offices or remotely. At the same time, we're going to do this again in January. Why do we do it twice? Well, because things do change. And so one of the things that we encourage is that you take advantage of this particular webcast, but also sign up for the one that we're going to be doing in January in case there are some changes that take place between now and then. So what are we going to cover over the next half hour or so? First of all, federal tax law changes that you need to know about. I like to kind of break this into two different sections when it comes to the federal laws and the, and the tax code. One, there are some things you absolutely are going to need to know. And then there's some things that are nice to know. You might run across them once or twice over the course of a tax season. And we'll cover those at the end. But the first section we want to focus on federal tax laws that you absolutely need to know about. On top of that, we'll talk about extended provisions that are still in effect for 2020. We'll also touch base on the latest with regard to ITIN, IP pins, and P tins. It's important to know what's going on in, those, in that particular world. We're going to talk to you for just a moment about federal forms that are available in Spanish this year and how it is that you can print them in our program. We're going to talk about additional changes of note, and we're going to finish up, as I said before, with other federal tax law changes that you should know about. Again, we're going to emphasize the most important ones at the beginning, and then we'll go ahead and we'll come back with some of the lesser known or lesser needed uh, changes that are going to take place, and we'll do that at the end. Now, what's really nice is that even though our program is not available to you folks yet, we'll be, we'll be bringing it out here in the next couple of weeks, I have an advanced copy of it. And so one of the things that we're going to be able to do is as I go through some of these federal tax law changes, we can actually toggle into the program and show you exactly where they will appear on the 1040. So that'll be nice to kind of make everything complete because we do have new lines, new forms that are going to be available this year. So let's go ahead and kick off with federal tax law changes of note. And these are the ones that you're going to be using the most often. And really important right away is the recovery rebate credit. And that has to do, of course, with the stimulus checks that, were that took place earlier in this year. There's a refundable credit for taxpayers who did not receive the full economic impact payment, the EIP, in 2020. So what is it that we're talking about? It's going to show up on line 30 in the Form 1040. Now, what's really interesting is, is that if you take a look at, at the, uh, the Form 1040 for this last year, there were only 24 lines. So how could it be on line 30? We'll show you here in just a moment what the new 1040 is going to look for, like for the upcoming year. But you're going to find this on line 10, or excuse me, line 30 of the Form 1040. Now, the calculation is done on a worksheet in the Form 1040 instructions. So you'll want to look at the instructions, and they'll tell you exactly how you're going to complete that. And the calculation is based on the taxpayer's 2020 income, their filing status, and, of course, the number of eligible children that they had. Okay? Now, the calculated credit is then reconciled with the payment received in 2020. What is it that we're trying to say there? Well, if you did receive some of that money, you know what? This would be a reconciliation. If you received all of it and you're trying to make this credit, guess what? There's going to be something in which the reconciliation will be that you're going to be giving the IRS some money back to give the federal government some money back. So one of the things to be very, very cognizant of in this particular area is that when you're working with your clients is that they're saying that they didn't get that. You'll want to double check. You really will because you don't want to put them into a position where they've received something and then they're making a claim for not having received it because they're going to come back. There's going to be a reconciliation with them, so there'll be an adjustment. And then on top of that, there's going to be a delay. Without question, their refund's going to be delayed, and you don't want that. Okay? So taxpayers in the following circumstances will have a refundable credit for 2020. Just at a high level, note that taxpayers that did not receive any economic stimuluses, and of course, that would be the $2,400 for married filing jointly and $1,200 for all other filing statuses, either head of household or if you're filing single. Economic stimulus payment was limited based on the income in 2018, 2019, and 2020 income, and it was below the income limit. And the taxpayer did not receive a payment for eligible children. So those are the situations where, you know what, they might not have gotten what they, what they, they were entitled to. But please note that for a vast majority of taxpayers, this credit will be calculated as zero since they received their full economic stimulus payment during 2020. So as a professional, one of the things that you'll want to make sure that you're doing is making sure that you are, you are double checking when you're asking about this, because in most instances, people did receive their economic stimulus. Now, what I'd like to do right here is just quickly show you in the program itself, I can pop into this. And what's really interesting is here's the new 1040 form itself. And as I said, last year, there would have been 24 lines. But as you notice, there's going to be, and we're going to come back to this on multiple different occasions here, but if you'll notice, now there's a line 30. It goes all the way down to 38, by the way. 
So you know, one of the funny things is the government had spoke about how they were beginning to condense the 1040 form and they were going to be using attached schedules. We still have those, but it's grown again. So if it was down to 24 lines last year, we're all the way up to 38 for this year. And on line 30, you'll see here's the recovery rebate credit. So if you're in a situation where you do the calculations, use the worksheet instructions, and then you, can, you feel that the person's entitled to that, that's where you'll be entering that particular information. Okay? So we'll pop back into, the, into what we're providing. Next up. Oh, by the way, the IRS is expected to have a lookup tool. This is just a side note. They do not have it at this time. But the expectation is that they'll have a lookup tool available for taxpayers to see the amount they received in 2020. My hope is, is that it will be available come the first of the year and certainly before the tax season itself starts. But it is very important that once it becomes available, make sure that you're having your clients check that, so double check it. Because if they say that they've received that particular stimulus check and they, ha and they say that they haven't, they'll want to look at that tool once it becomes available. Okay. Next up, we're going to talk about charitable contributions above the line deductions. First of all, a taxpayer may deduct up to $300 as an adjustment to the income of the 2020 federal tax return in claiming the standard deduction. Now, we know that 90% of customers that are out there, or your clients out there, are going to be claiming the standard deductions. So with regard to that, 300 is the maximum they're going to be able to receive. It'll be a new line 10B on the 1040, which I'll show you in just a moment. On top of that, the maximum deduction amount is 300 per return, regardless of the filing status. This does not mean $600 if you're mainly filing jointly or anything along those lines or head of household, which is usually kind of 1.5 of a filing single. It's going to be the same on everyone. $300 is the max. Okay. And with regard to that, let's pop into the program real quick and we'll just show you. As I said before, we now have 38 lines in our 1040 where we had 24 before, but there you find it right there. Online 10B is the charitable contributions it's asking if it, it's taking a standard deduction. It's right there. Okay. Popping back, we're going to talk about payroll tax, the Social Security portion, and payment extensions. And this is going to be important to note this because we're going to see some people taking advantage of this. It permits, permits excuse me, employers and self-employed individuals to delay the payment of 6.2 employer share of the Social Security tax between 327, meaning March 27th, and the end of the year. Why is this? Of course, that's when COVID really did hit the uh, hit the mainstream, if you will, and because of that, because of some of the shutouts and some of the stimulus that, that was trying to take place at that particular time, one of the things that the government would like to do is say that, hey, if you're contributing to the Social Security portion, you can go ahead and you can delay that. Now, it doesn't mean that you're not going to be responsible for paying it. Any deferred tax will need to be paid during the following two years with half paid at the end of 2021 the other half at the end of 2022. And for individuals, this will be calculated on the Schedule South self-employed, the SE, or on Schedule H. On the Schedule SE, that's the self-employment tax, the calculation needs to be done in part three. Well, we can go ahead and we can show you exactly how that will look in case you're in a circumstance like that. If I went ahead and I added the Self-employment tax. Here's your Schedule SC, and you'll you'll be completing this particular information for the maximum deferral of self-employment tax payments down here in Part Three. Okay. Next up, IRA changes uh, in individual retirement accounts. There's some important things of note here. Beginning in 2020, taxpayers may contribute to an IRA after the age of 70 and a half. We knew that it was 70 and a half, and we're seeing people in the workforce longer, so the government has made an adjustment to that. What it also means is um, when you want to do that, if you want to contribute to your IRA after 70 and a half, you do have to check with your bank. Now, I can't imagine that any banks will be out there saying you can't do that, but you always start by checking with the, with the institutions that are going to be holding your IRAs. Now, Required distribution must now begin at age 72. It had to begin before at 70 and a half. And this will be for taxpayers that turn 70 and a half after 2019. So it's going to be a very small percentage. But what they're saying there is you can wait to 72 if you happen to turn 70 and a half during the, 20, the year 2020. Okay. And obviously before this change is when they reached 70 and a half. And I think that you all know exactly what this means. It's a small circle of folks that, you know what, were, would all of a sudden be in a position where they had to start taking some of the distribution, but they're not going to have to do it until 72 because they happen to be 70 and a half right now. Okay. Distributions of up to $5,000 that are used for childbirth or adoption will not be subject to the 10% early withdrawal penalty. 
nice situation if you're in a position where you, uh, because of childbirth, because of an expense associated with the adoption, you can go ahead and take a distribution early and not have to worry about the withdrawal penalty. Okay. Next up, I want to talk about COVID-19 retirement distributions. And this is really interesting. So you've got your accounts out there, or more specifically your tax paying clients do, some interesting things that are going to take place. This is very similar to the retirement provisions for federally declared disasters that have happened in the past. And we certainly have had those over the last couple of years. For distributions that are related to COVID-19, an individual may do the following. First of all, they can withdraw up to $100,000 free of the 10% early withdrawal penalty and spread the taxable portion over the next three years. So what that's saying is somebody's in a tight spot, they can take up to 100,000 out of their, of their retirement, okay? The withdrawal will not be taxable if the distribution is recontributed within the next three years. So it's a short-term situation. You're still responsible for putting that money back into that account. The maximum loan amount for COVID-19 purposes is going to be 100,000. So as we said before, there isn't any kind of um, stipulation that says that you can take more than that, but it should be something that of note, if you have somebody that's in a position where they're really, really in a bad way, if they do have a retirement account because of COVID, they do have the right to go ahead and take uh, an early withdrawal, but they have to recontribute it back into, the, into their account, okay? Next up, credit for sick leave and family leave for certain self-employed individuals. This, of course, has to do kind of similar with the Family Medical Leave Act. And so it allows self-employed and individuals affected by the pandemic to claim a credit for any time they were unable to work because they had coronavirus or they needed to care for someone else who had or has coronavirus. So it is a credit for sick leave and family leave for these individuals. And the credit is calculated on the new Form 7202. We're going to go ahead and pop back into the program very quickly. If I go ahead and add a form, there is a brand new 7202, and there it is, credits for sick leave and family leave for certain self-employed individuals. So as you can see, when our program comes out, it's already going to have all these forms that you're going to need that are different from last year. That's good news as, as, we, as we are about to go ahead to the press, as I think they were about to go to press, we're about to release next year's program, and that will be at the beginning of December. Now, amount from this new form transfers directly into the Form 1040 Schedule 3, Line 12B. So what it's saying is you complete that information, it's going to pull it, and it's going to put it appropriately into the Form 1040. Okay, so those are the uh, tax law updates that are the most essential. And you can see a lot of it has to do with the pandemic that we're, we find ourselves in and, and, and the economic situations that are associated with it. Other things of note, the extended provisions, first of all, the most relevant extended provision still in effect for 2020, which means that they're going to expire in December at the end of this year. First of all, the tuition and fees deduction, which is found on Form 8917, Schedule 1, Line 21. I can go in here if you like. I can show you exactly Form 8917. I can go ahead and add this. As you all know, all of you that have worked in the program, there it is. Your tuition and fees deduction, it is going to be available there, be extended. Okay? Other ones? Exclusion from income for foreclosed home mortgages, that's form, found on Form 982, and that'll be found on line 1E. And the medical expense deduction score remains at 7.5%. That's all found on your Schedule A. And also on your Schedule A, please note the ability to treat mortgage insurance premiums as qualified mortgage interest. Both these last two are found on your Schedule A. The interesting one is the medical expense, the floor, still remains the same at 7.5%. Now, there are additional business and energy-related provisions still in effect for 2020. For a full list, we didn't want to go into some of the more uh, lesser-known ones, if you will, uh, but we do want to make sure that you're aware of where you can find this information. You can look at your Pub 17 for 2019. You'll find it on pages 1 and 2, Impact of New Legislation. So if you, if you want or you're caught in a situation where you want to know if there's an extender that uh, wasn't listed here, you can go ahead to your 2019 Pub 17, you'll find the information right there at the front, pages one and two of the impact of new legislation. Okay. Next up, let's talk about ITINs, PTINs, and IP pins. First of all, when it comes to the ITINs, we're going to talk about the expiration of ITINs. Now, this is very interesting. At the end of 2020, ITINs with the following middle digits will expire and must be renewed. Now, in all instances, in all instances, if the middle digits are 88, it's going to have to be renewed. 
On top of that, there's an interesting list. And these are the ones that were issued before 2013 and have not been renewed. So something was issued as of seven years ago and it has not been renewed. The middle digits are 90, 91, 92, 94, 95, 96, 97, 98, 99. Those will have to be renewed because ultimately uh, they will expire. Okay. Also, any item that has not been used for the past three years, that's in 2017, 2018, and 2019. In those particular instances, they will expire as well. This will be the last year that items issued before 2013 need to be renewed. So that's an important piece of information to know as well. Now, with regard to PTINs, very important right here. All preparers must still renew and obtain a PTIN. It's still the case. It has been the case. And ultimately, what does that mean? The renewal period for 2021 began in October. So it's already in place. And this is an IRS fee. Please note that the IRS does expect $35.95 to be paid for every single new or renewed PTIN. So PTIN is required for all the people that are preparing taxes in your particular office. It's $36 a shot. And of course, it's done through the IRS website. With regard to IP PINs, beginning in January 2021, any taxpayer may request an IP PIN through the Get an IP PIN tool that's found on the IRS website. Now, I'm going to get a little bit granular here because there's some interesting things associated with this. First of all, the hope is, is that if you go, go to the Get an IP IPIN tool, it's going, to be, it, it's, going to be, it's going to work for you, in other words. So if an individual cannot get through the secure access process, and that's what it's called, and that's going to happen maybe half the time, I'm speculating, maybe 40%, they will need to do one of the following. First of all, if the adjusted gross income is less than 72000 on their most recently federally filed return. Check this out, folks. First of all, they're going to complete a new form 15227. And I can't even show you the 15227 because it doesn't even exist yet. So the IRS is still working on this, but it's very interesting about it. They're going to have to complete this. Then on top of that, and, and they're going to have to send it in, and an IRS assister will then call the individual and verify the identity. Then on top of that, once it's verified, the taxpayer will receive an IP PIN near the end of 2021. So this is a year-long process, folks. And then they'll be able to use it on their 2021 federal return next year. Okay. So this is if the adjusted gross income is less than 72000 If it happens to be over that, it's a little bit faster process to getting you this IP PIN. First of all, they'll still call the IRS and make an appointment to have an IRS tax payer assistance center and they'll authenticate themselves in person and then once authenticated the taxpayer will receive an ip pin in the mail within three weeks which is good to use for this year so there are going to be two and you can see how much um i don't know i don't know if it's red tape but there seems to be a lot that's involved here let's just hope if somebody wants to get an ip pin that the secure access process is going to work for them if not you're going to have to follow the instructions or more specifically have them follow the instructions and you'll see that, again, there's a difference between if the adjusted gross income for that particular individual is above or below 72000 Okay. Federal forms that are going to be made available this year in Spanish. This is kind of exciting news within the, within the IRS community. Just something to note. First of all, the IRS has added Spanish versions of the following forms for tax year 2020. That will be Form 1040 and 1040 SR. That's for senior and Schedules 1 through 3. Schedule 8812, which is the additional tax credit, child tax credit, Schedule EIC, the Form 1040, and Schedule 8812 instructions. And finally, Crosslink users will have an option to print Form 1040s and Schedules 1 through 3 in Spanish. So it's not going to show up in Spanish in our program, but if you want to print that particular ret uh, return in Spanish, you'll be able to do so. Now, this is still being built in our program right now, so I can't show you. But there will be a place where you can go ahead and make a request for Spanish. And then if you want to print that current form, and it's one of these, it's going to print in Spanish for you. So oh, additional changes of note. Let's go ahead and take a look at some other things that are worth noting before the tax season itself. Number one, Form 1099-NEC. It's a non-employee compensation reported on this brand new form. And what was previously reported on the 1099 miscellaneous. So there's this brand new NEC form for 1099. And many states will require this form be filed with their return. So this is really important on the, on, the, on, the, uh, on the state side of things, if you happen to be in a state in which has its own state income tax, okay? Health insurance mandate penalty is really, really interesting because we know that last year, the penalty on the federal side gone away, it's still not there. So there is no penalty 
but if you don't have health insurance. However, the following states have a mandate with a penalty provision. That'll include California, Massachusetts, New Jersey, Rhode Island, and the Washington, D.C. area itself. So please note that even though at the federal side that was gone, that, that was gone away with, it, there's still certain states that have a mandate with a penalty provision associated with it. Next up, I want to talk about virtual currency. We talked about this last year as well, but it is of note. Last year was being introduced by the IRS, and the IRS is getting more and more specific about this. And it's very important for you as a tax professional to be giving counsel to your tax paying clients. First of all, the following question is now on Form 1040. It's going to be found right on page one. At any time during 2020, did you receive, sell, send, exchange, or otherwise acquire any financial interest in any virtual currency? I can pop into the program itself. And in doing so, I'm going to go back to the 1040. And there it is. At any time during 2020, did you receive, sell, send, exchange, so on and so forth? And you're going to want to answer this question for every one of your tax paying clients. Otherwise, you know what? The IRS is going to look at this particular return and might not even get through a verification stage. But I can tell you right now, they are, they, the IRS is definitely looking at this in, in, in closely. So question is to help educate taxpayers on tax consequences of engaging in virtual currency transactions. That is why the government started this, but they're getting more and more um, specific about what it is that the ramifications are if you are dealing in virtual currency. One of the consequences of using virtual currency is that if a taxpayer uses virtual currency to buy something, the IRS considers the sale of a capital asset. So guess what? You're going to get nicked pretty good on that, and it must be reported on a Schedule D. Again, it's not just considered to be cash. It is considered to be a capital asset. So there is a difference in where it is that you're going to have to complete that return. Also, if the taxpayer receives virtual currency, it can be considered income if it is for compensation or for services performed for someone and must be reported on the taxpayer's income tax return. So guess what? In any instance, you're going to want to make sure you're answering the question on the 1040 and, and pay close attention um, as to how it is that that virtual currency was used by the taxpayer. Okay? Information on virtual currency can be found on the IRS website. Maybe this is the most important thing of all, is to make sure that you're following up. Look at the virtual currency page, as well as frequently asked questions on virtual currency transactions. And, you know, here's a little bit of fine print for you, a little bit of relevance. All taxpayers should answer this question. I said it before. You see it right on 1040. It's right on the first page. Make sure that the, you have your folks answering. It. And this year, the question will appear on all returns. Last year, for reference, it was only on Schedule 1 and only appeared on the printed form if the taxpayer answered yes, or on Schedule 1 had the, had the amounts on it. So here's where it gets a little bit different. They really want everybody answering that question. We talked about it before. I want to make sure that everyone understands the importance and that the IRS is looking to see if there are transactions that took place specifically with virtual currency. Next up, Schedule LEP. What is LEP? Well, i got to be honest with you, I don't even know what the acronym stands for, but it is important to understand that it's beginning for this year. And what is it? It allows taxpayers to indicate a preference for what language, other than English, that they wish to receive written communications from the IRS. So if they want to get a notice from the IRS, they would they prefer to get it in another language? Now, why is the IRS doing this? Will they immediately mean that they're going to send out communications to everyone in the, in the preferred language? Not at all. There, in fact, there is no guarantee that the taxpayer will receive communications in the preferred language immediately. However, the IRS is doing this for a purpose. For this first year, the IRS will use this information from this form to determine the order that additional languages will be implemented. So certainly, depending on which language is being put in and how often that information has been provided, it will play a role in how the IRS begins to enhance its services in other languages. So what I do recommend is, is that, you know what, if folks are speaking a specific language or want to have information in a specific language, you know what, go ahead and complete the schedule at LEP. Okay? With regard to Form 1040X, which has to do with e-filing, guess what? The IRS began to allow amended federal returns to be filed this last August. And that was nice because they always had to send that in by paper in the past. One of the things to note for filing season 2021 you may file amended returns electronically for tax years 2020 and 2019, in which the original return was filed electronically. So you can only do it in circumstances where you originally did it electronically as well. Now, with regard to 1040NR, non-residents, please note 
that it's going to be redesigned this year to be similar to the layout of the Form 1040 and will now use Schedules 1, 2, and 3, just like the 1040 does. So nice to note that we're trying to make things as uniform, or more specifically, the IRS is trying to make things as uniform as they can, and on the end for, uh, the Form 1040-NR, it's going to look and feel a lot now like the Form 1040, okay? Now, at the beginning of the, the broadcast, they said, look, there's some other federal things that we want to at least touch on. We've covered the very most important things, but I do want to make sure that we make reference to a couple of the things of, of note. Other federal tax law changes include qualified improvement property. Keep this in the back of mind. Might be nothing that you're going to be taking care of, or it could be with some of your tax paying clients. In either event, please note the following. Technical rec excuse me, a technical correction for depreciation improvements was made to buildings. So on the qualified improvement property, there's just something that's been updated with regard to that. It allows this property to now be depreciated over 15 years and makes it eligible for bonus depreciation. Okay? Changes to net operating losses. So if you're doing a return that includes net, net operating losses, losses that occurred in 2018, 19, and 2020 can be carried back five years. And these losses can be fully offset income for in prior years. And finally, applicable to both individuals as well as corporations. Another uh, lesser known federal, uh, federal change, charitable contributions, the 50% adjusted gross income limit is suspended for 2020. With regard to changes to business interest limitations, kind of interesting for 2019 and 2020, the interest deduction for businesses is increased to 50% of taxable income. It was 30% and will again be after December 31st, 2020. So what we're trying to say is, is that, you know what, for next year, it's going to go back to 30%, but for this year and for last year, it will be increased to 50%. With regard to employee retention credits, if anyone's interested in taking these, eligible employers may take a refundable payroll tax credit equal to 50% of qualified wages paid to employees from March to December of last year. Again, this has to do and coincides with when the coronavirus kind of hit. For more information, see the IRS website, and you can go to Frequently Asked Questions, Employee Retention Credit. Last one, Qualified Business Income Deduction. This is the third year that this is applicable, but it is worth noting because this is a little bit complex. For 2020, an individual may be able to deduct 20% of their domestic qualified business income from a partnership, an S-corp, or even a sole proprietorship. And the qualified business income includes the following, net income from a Schedule C, partnership K-1s, subchapter SK-1s, and possibly rental income that was reported on a Schedule E. Now, for greater, approximately 90%, maybe even more of taxpayers, this deduction is calculated as, as the lesser of two things. First of all, 20% of their qualified business income or 20% of their taxable income, income, excluding any kind of capital gains. And it will be reported on Form 8995, the Qualified Business Income Simplified Calculation Form, which shows the calculation of this deduction for most taxpayers. Now, that brings us to the end of what we wanted to cover today. However, I do want to make note of the Crosslink Tax Resource Center. And as John said, we have a brand new website or updated website. We've always had this available to you, but it is great to note that you can find out a lot of information in a very timely manner by continuing to kind of check out our resource center. So helpful and continually updated information is located through our Crosslink Tax Resource Center. How do you get there? Simply go to our brand new, our updated website, crosslinktax.com, go to customer resources, and then to the Tax Resource Center. And just to give you an example of some of the posts that are available all the time and updated as needed, it includes pay, prepare, due diligence, things to know for the current year, as well as tax updates. So again, even though we were kind of finishing up what it is that we know as of today, don't hesitate to continue to use our resource center in case there's further information that's being updated over the course of the next six weeks. Now, also note that we will be doing an IRS update again in the January timeframe. Now, that brings me to the end of what it is that I wanted to cover. John, I'm going to turn it back over to you to find out if, some, if there's some additional questions that we can go ahead and field. All right. Thank you, Steve. Um, in addition to Steve, you'll hear the voice of Mark Castro, who is our government liaison here at Crosslink, and he'll be able to answer some of the more detailed questions as well. Steve, um, we were asked a couple times if we could reshow, and I don't know if you still have it available, line 30 uh, from within the software. 
So we can go into the 1040 itself. And it is great. You know, that's a great question everyone asks because we got so used to the condensed 1040 and it's it's expanded. You, you know, the same thing, looking at 10B, looking at these types of things that have all of a sudden been added, certainly going down, there's your the recovery rebate credit. And this is, of course, something that's going to be completed uh, when somebody doesn't feel that they received their full stimulus. Okay, good. Um, all right, so um, on this, um, I'm going to read this verbatim. This might be one that, that may, and I think it addresses a couple of questions here uh, that possibly uh, Mark can provide some color to. But since the uh, stimulus check was given based on income and the dependent on the taxpayer 2018 and 2019 tax year return, will taxpayers be able to claim stimulus payments for, for dependents that were born in 2020? Ah, great yeah, question, Mark. Yes, there you yeah, go. This is Mark. Um, yeah, they will be able to claim um, a dependent that was, I mean, a, a qualifying child, which is under 18, um, and if that was born in 2020 on this return. So this, you would then get a re recovery rebate credit for that child. Okay. And does uh, Mark does, uh, does does that is there any date requirement? For example, does it need to be born? Does a child need to be born before the date the stimulus was released, or is it any point during the 2020 year? Any point during 2020. Okay, excellent. Um, we've got a few. I love, questions. love those December babies. <laughs> <laughs> got to get to work, people. Uh, the uh, 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 we have some questions in regards to EIPs and and ITINs. So first of all, will the software be able to identify taxpayers that were eligible for the economic impact payment? Well, I believe so. I'm not sure about the item problem, but the issue, but the but based on the age of the taxpayer, I mean of the child, um, if they were born in 2020. You'll have to go through the worksheet and figure out whether they can um, take it or not. And again, you can the the worksheet works. You put in the information, and then it will will ask it will ask for the uh, amount that they received during the year, and then that reconciles to whether it's whether it's um, zero or they get uh, additional refund. And the one other thing to remember is that for the um, recovery rebate credit economic stimulus payment. They don't have to pay anything back. So if they all of a sudden in 2020 their income was too high for some reason, and they didn't, um, they didn't, uh, wouldn't originally qualify for it. They still they don't have to pay anything back. So it's, okay. it's if they get additional, they get it. If not, they don't have to do anything. All right, that makes sense. You know, John. Hey, hey, John. If I can add something sure. to that, that's a great answer. Thank you, thank you, Mark. You know, a lot of these things um, might be answered when people use the interview mode of the software, but we haven't seen that yet. You know, it's still too early because we haven't seen the program come out yet, but our folks are, they're pretty magical on that stuff. And uh, our developers, uh, it could be something that's answered literally as you're going through an interview, if you go through the interview process as opposed to a form space. I can't answer that specifically, but I would speculate we're looking at that. Okay, that makes perfect sense. Um, Mark, um, and, and just for a reminder for, for everybody, Mark, um, those with I-10s, uh, did they qualify this year for the EIP? I don't believe they did, no. Um, it's just like anything else. The Congress is not going to allow um, anybody that doesn't have a, that's not a citizen or does not have a um, Social Security number to get an EIP payment, um, just like they do with the credits. That makes sense. All right. Um, uh, I lost my place. Okay, amendments. Um, last year we were able to do some of those amendments electronically. Will that be the case this year, or was that a, a one-year um, activity? No. Now the IRS has oh, started. Forward. This is the beginning. Uh, this is the beginning of doing amended returns. So the IRS has started a slow rollout. Last year it was 2019 returns that were filed electronically. For this, for the next year in 2021, you can amend electronically returns for 2019 or 2020 that were filed electronically. Okay, excellent. Yeah, the original needs to be done electronically. More, yep. They'll add more, 
you know, they'll add more in future years to eventually where you can eventually expand to any amended return. But for right now, they're just um, they're just they're getting a slow roll out here. Okay, fair enough. Um, I'm I'm going through these questions in the order they were asked. Um, so if I'm bouncing around a little bit, Mark and Steve, my apologies. Um, what should uh, a tax preparer or a taxpayer do if they if the taxpayer loses their IP pin? If so they lose their the IP, IP pin, pin, then they can go. Yeah, they can go to get IP pin and they can um, retrieve it if they can get through secure access. Okay. So and for people, and that was the one with John. Of, yeah, just one go one ahead, other thing. So if people in the past have had an IP pin, they should have gotten a letter or should be getting a letter soon um, for their IP pin for this coming year. And so if they lose that letter and they can't remember what their IP pin is, they need to go to the get IP pin tool once it once it comes back up online um to retrieve their their pin. Okay. Um uh, this one has to do with a couple of uh next couple of questions are, are deadline related. Um I don't believe Mark and correct me if I'm wrong, but I do not believe that there uh a start for the tax season has been announced yet. I don't know if you have anything you can share on that front. No, the IRS has not announced the start date yet. The IRS is not going to announce that for a little while. They're still trying to make sure Congress does not do um, additional legislation or even have an additional economic stimulus payment. Um, the IRS needs to know that information for sure before they can say when the filing season will begin. Okay. So. And the next one I can take, which is uh, the question is, when will the software be available for this year? I'll use Crosslink 1040 as the baseline for that. Uh, that software will be released the first week in December. So we're talking next week, folks. Uh, we will have the software available for you. Um, it will allow you to play, play around and look at all the things we just showed today. That's great. Yeah, it's early. Correct. Uh, yeah, that'll be nice. You'll be able to take a look at this. And then in addition to the, uh, we have additional webinars coming up on the how to or what's new, and then you'll be able to follow along and see what's what's available out there. So uh, that's good information available for you there as well. Um, okay, the next question, is the 1099 NEC form a modified version of unemployment? You I mean, I'm not sure what the, question means. Um, okay. The NEC, only, the only difference with the NEC this year, in the past, if you had non-employee compensation, it was reported on the 1099 MISC. This year, the IRS um, created or brought back the 1099 NEC because the 1099 NEC non-employee compensation has to be reported to the IRS earlier than the other miscellaneous income. So if you have... Um, if somebody is uh, a contractor and getting non-employee compensation from somebody, then they will get a 1099 NEC instead of a 1099 MISC this year. Okay, and Steve, it looks like you've brought that up for everybody to see now. Yep. Okay. All right. Uh, uh, next up, um, and I don't know if you know this off the top of your head, uh, Mark, or not, but do you happen to know um, – how much there will be, uh, how much the sick leave credit will be this year? Or is that dependent on a case-by-case -case basis? Depends on the calculation on the Form 7202. It's similar to the um, the corporate um, the bus the corporate um, credit that came out um, with uh, a couple of years ago. They added it for self-employment. And so you just need to go, it's based on how many days um, you were not working because of either you had COVID or you are taking care of somebody. And then it goes sure. through the calculation. Okay, that makes sense. Look at that. It's literally on line one, number of days of period between the, that you were unable to perform. It's right there on the 7202 first line. Perfect. Yeah, so once you get that, or you, um, once you get the form, um, once the instructions and and um, form comes out, you can see what the um, – but how it's calculated, but again, it's just a calculation based on the number of days. Um, the sick leave part of it is basically for the self-employed person. The family leave part of it is more if you're taking care of somebody, that's where they get the 
the uh, Steve, um, could you it. maybe do a, a 30 second or less recap? I don't think I'll take that long for that slide uh, regarding the virtual currency. Again, this is kind of a new a new topic for many individuals. And I'm going to ask Mark to help. I mean, there is some fine print that's associated with this. The idea is that everybody's going to ask whether or not they're dealing in virtual currency. That's going to be the first thing, and you need to make sure that you're answering it on behalf of all of your tax paying clients. So each one of them, that question is literally on the 1040, page one of it. Beyond that, as far as how it is, is that you're being held accountable if you're dealing in virtual currency. Mark, why don't you go ahead and take through the importance of understanding the capital asset side as well as the fact that if you're using it, it is also considered income. Okay, so the IRS has made it this a point of emphasis starting last year to try to figure out who is dealing in virtual currency. And if they are, they've been starting to send out notices if they think they have been to say that they need to report this in, um, on their return. The most important thing to remember is that the IRS does not consider this a currency like, you know, dollars or or whatever. Um, it is currency. They consider it a commodity. So if you if you if your customer or taxpayer receives um, or purchases um, virtual currency, converts their money into virtual currency, and then they go out and purchase something in the virtual currency, that is a capital transaction that must be reported on Schedule D. And the IRS is, like I said, is making that a point of emphasis and trying to make sure that people understand that and understand that they need to report that on their um, Schedule D. And that's if you go and read the information that, on the IRS website about virtual currency and the, the uh, facts, it explains how how this works. So, so yeah. that's that's the that's the point of emphasis. So they're not people. The IRS has seen that people are not doing what they're supposed to be doing, and so they want to make sure people understand they're supposed to do that. Okay. Perfect. Um, for people that have had, thank you, I, Mark. Yeah, thank you very much, Mark. Um, uh, for people, and by the way, folks, we, we've got a few minutes left. I'm going to get to as many of these questions as I can. Uh, like I said, some we may not be able to get to, and if that's the case, we'll have a uh, crossing team member follow up with you. Um, but for people who have had identity theft in previous years, uh, do they need to go through the same step to obtain an IP pin if they don't receive it by mail, or are they able to contact the IRS directly? If they have went through the process, the IRS has to confirm that they've had identity theft by filling out the, the paperwork, the form that they need to fill out. And the IRS has, has confirmed that they're identity victim of identity theft then they would have been issued an IP pin, and from then on, they're going to get an IP pin every single year. Um, and so if they've gotten one in the past, they should get a letter letter around December, early January time frame that shows them what their IP pin is for the next year. Um, and they will get one forever after that. And, and until they, IRS says you can opt out of it. And if they don't so receive they that should letter? Get one. If they don't receive it, then they need to um, contact the IRS okay. um, and go through the maybe get IP PIN program or just call the IRS and ask them um, that they never received it. But they should be able to get it on the get IP PIN tool as well if they didn't they didn't receive it to see what their IP PIN is. And if they have any questions further than that, they may have to call the IRS to ask questions. Okay. Um so there's a couple questions here about stimulus and college students and so i'm going to try to uh, kind of uh, combine uh, all these questions into one with maybe a scenario uh, a parent claims let's say the the student's 21 college students 21 uh, they claim their daughter but the daughter did not receive a stimulus payment uh, is that because they claimed her will she receive the stimulus will the parent receive the stimulus now the student would have to receive the stimulus if they're over. Um, actually, if their claim is a dependent on the other's return, yeah, I, I'm not clear if they actually get the stimulus. If they do deserve the stimulus, then they would have to file a return um, to get their stimulus payment. If they didn't already get, if they didn't fill out the tool that that doesn't exist anymore. Um, 
Okay. I would have to get back to you on that. I don't know exact details. Sure. On that part. And it's certainly, if you follow the logic of it, you know, you had to have a tax return in, el- el- in order to be eligible for a stimulus before. So, John, it makes sense if you were a dependent and you didn't. In that particular instance, you'd probably be in a position where you, you're not eligible for it. Sure. So you wouldn't be right. eligible if you didn't have any income during the right. year and you're, if you were dependent of somebody else. But if you had income... Um, and, and you didn't receive it, or you didn't, you didn't have to file a return because your income was so low, um, then you would have to you file a return to get it. Okay. Um, what, if any, impact is, uh, would the stimulus have on EITC going into the new year? It has no impact at all. It's not considered income. It's not. It's not anything. It's just. It's just a, um, a stimulus payment that was made. It has no impact on figuring out EITC. Okay. Uh, will there be a special code this year for Box 7 on the 1099-R for COVID distributions? Do you happen to know that one? I don't know, but if we had something for – this is a similar thing that happened with disasters. So if we had something for disasters in the past, we should have something for COVID this year similarly. If that's the way it worked. I don't know for sure. I'd have to – but yes, if it, if this existed in the past, I imagine it would exist to this time too. Okay. Yeah, folks, and, and a lot of this, we're answering what we're able to answer with what we know now. There will be more information. And as, as Steve Kratzky mentioned um, early in the presentation, we will be doing the tax updates again in January. And so for a lot of these things that we don't have a lot of answers for right now, uh, we will um, hopefully have some more answers uh, come January. All right, I'm just going to do a couple more because we are nearing the end of the hour. Uh, but uh, 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 there is a there is a question here, Steve, about when we will release the Kraken. Uh, <laughs> <so>. <laughs> hey, uh, we're, uh, we're we're up here in Seattle. We're pretty proud of our new hockey team, so that's why you see that behind me. So <laughs> right, right. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so, uh, Mark, we've kind of answered this question, I think, indirectly, but just more directly, the, the question is, if a taxpayer receives the EIP, do they have to pay it back, or how do they pay tax, or, or do they have to pay taxes on it? No, it's non-taxable income, and they don't have to pay it back if their income went too high. So, um, so. No, it has no impact on the tax return other than the fact that you might get additional credit if you didn't receive the full amount. Okay. Uh, all right, folks, I, I know we weren't able to get to all the questions. Uh, we had great questions, uh, that, and there's quite a few more coming in, and we will have somebody follow up with you on these. Um, we do want to thank you for taking the time to join us today. Uh, Mark, I'd like to thank you for taking the time to answer the questions. Um, again, folks, if you want more information on a lot of these tax updates, we encourage you to look at the uh, crosslinktax.com website. Again, that's a new website. Maybe if you have what looks, if the, the view looks a little funky because it was released today, just clear your cache and cookies, reload the site. It should pop up just fine for you. What's going to happen is if you go there, you'll see the tax updates page. You see the path to it right now, and there is a lot of information there. There'll be a lot more information between now and the start of the tax season, so we encourage you to do that. Additionally, for those of you that are still asking about copies of this presentation, yes, we will make those available via our YouTube page in approximately a week. That is youtube.com slash crosslink tax. As a matter of fact, Steve, why don't you pull that page up and we can show people how they can participate in the conversation with us. Right there, folks, um, you can see the page. Uh, on those pages, we do encourage you to participate in the conversation with us. We share a lot of information. And for those of you that do follow us, we don't do a lot of marketing on there unless we're doing something like pushing a webinar like this today. So uh, please take a, a few moments, subscribe to, to some of those pages. And then if we go back a slide, we would like to remind everybody that today was just one of the many webinars that we're doing between now and the start of the season, including, as we've mentioned a couple times, in January, we will be doing the IRS tax updates again. And then for those of you that have any interest in Crosslink Online, next week's webinar will be on the introduction of the introduction and completion 
of a tax return across like online. So it'll give you an opportunity to see the see the product and see how that is working. And that will be led by Steve, if I'm not mistaken, that'll be led by Priscilla on your team, correct? That is correct. And the following will actually do it in Spanish as well. And that'll be led by another one of my senior trainers, Gilbert. You folks will be in very, very good hands on all of these. So I highly recommend you you uh, um, sign up for these. The webinars really do help you prepare for the season. Okay, with that, folks, um, it's a holiday week. It's busy. We're all getting ready for the tax season. We appreciate the fact that you took some time out of your day to spend with us. Uh, and, and we do want to express that we are truly thankful for you. We're thankful for the time that you spent with us today. And we'd like to wish each and every one of you and your families a successful 2021. Uh, Steve, with that, if there's anything else you'd like to add, uh, now is the time. Just thank you so much, everyone, for take, taking time out of your, your day. Uh, we hope that you found some of this information, a lot of this information of help. I echo John in saying we have much to be thankful for. Please stay safe, take care of yourself, take care of your families. And again, we hope to talk to you again uh, soon on our next uh, webcast, which will start up again right after the holiday. All right, with that, that concludes today's Crosslink webinar. Thank you.